All right, Laurie, I think you can get started. Fantastic. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2020 Hatfield Marine Science Center Research Summit. We are thrilled to have you here. As you know, we had the first one last year in person and uh, all the things we learned last year, we had to throw out the window to do it virtually this year. The goals of the summit are, however, are similar to what we had last year, which is mainly to learn about the diversity of research conducted by Hat Hatfield staff and to increase opportunities for collaboration across the Hatfield campus. And with that, I'll turn it back to Cinnamon to introduce herself and talk about logistics. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I am Oregon State University's Research Program Manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center um, and one of your co-hosts today with Lori. Um, and again, just really excited to have you here and to be a part of this and to bring this community together. It feels like during COVID times, it's even more important that we have an opportunity to share. So I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the logistics for the first part of our summit for today. Um, we are using a Zoom platform and you've kind of seen us navigate that already a little bit. So unless you're presenting, we ask that you keep your camera, microphone and screen share off um, until we get to the conversation rooms. Um, we do have a really full agenda. So for those folks that are presenting, we ask that you try really hard to stay on time. Um, and we're gonna be a little bit ruthless about keeping us there. Um, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, we will talk a little bit more about the conversation rooms, the second part of our meeting once we get to there. So we don't have to worry about that right now. Um, Brendan is our IT support for today. If you're having any issues, um, you might see him pop up on the screen or you're able to chat with him if you have any questions. So feel free to reach out to him. Um, because of our full agenda, we might not have time to answer questions in the first part of today's event, but if you would like, you can add um, questions into the chat and uh, we'll get to them if we can. So um, other than that, we just really hope that you engage and you are uh, a part of this to you know, the full extent. So welcome everybody. So today's agenda, and I should say, uh, introduce myself since I forgot. My name is Lori Whitecamp. I work for the NOAA Fishery, Northwest Fishery Science Center, and I'm housed in the Barry Fisher Building on the Hatfield campus. This is our agenda today. So we've got some welcomes, some leadership welcomes. Uh, Bob Cowan will provide an overview of Hatfield and then a series of rapid talks on a variety of topics that really cut across the Hatfield campus. We'll take a brief break and, it, and at that point, at the end of the talks, some people will be leaving the meeting and then those of us who uh, opted to join the theme rooms will then go to those rooms and we'll finally wrap up by five o'clock tonight. And this is who we are when we set out the pre-survey poll this is what we got. And you can see that there's a lot of fisheries and ecology and oceanography and research and all kinds of things. And I think the real, real point is, is that although most of the people who work at Hatfield Marine Science Center are focused on the ocean, we look at it from all different directions. So it's, it's very exciting to have so many people looking at this common area from, from very different perspectives. And I think that will be highlighted in today's talk. And are we ready for poll number one? So yeah, so that just came out up on the screen. Um, so if we're just kind of curious who's here today. So if you want to select um, who you work for, that just gives us an idea of who's on the line today. That so like I, I do not see it from my screen, but that doesn't matter. It may be in my my screen problem. If you're getting responses, though, obviously the others can see it. Okay, it looks like Brendan. Can you um? Did you just uh, stop yep. the? Okay. It stopped and it's shared out there, and the results are shared. So you're not seeing it, Lori, because you're on a web browser. Ah, okay. gotcha. Okay. So. Uh, there are many of us that are on web browsers, so it looks like um, I'll just give a quick uh, summary. We have about 10% of folks that are from NOAA, 
Um, nobody from USDA right now. We definitely have some folks from US Fish and Wildlife, from EPA. Um, a majority of folks, 63% today are from OSU, 10% from Fish and Wildlife, about 10% are students, and we have a couple volunteers online. So welcome everybody. <laughs> All right, Fantastic. so I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Lori, and if you want to um, do the um, little warning and uh, then we'll hand it off to Bob. Fantastic. So uh, as I mentioned, last year was the first year we did it. This is the first time we've done it virtually. So if there's any bump, bumps in the road, uh, please work with us. For example, people who are on browsers can't see the polls. And I should also say that we listened to what you had to say last year, and we've tried to incorporate your comments, really excellent comments, into this year's. And we will again have a post-event survey, and we encourage you to uh, fill that out and provide us your feedback on how well this works. And with that, I will turn the meeting over to the director of Hatfield Marine Science Center, Bob Cowan, for the welcome. Thank you. Well, thanks, Laurie and Cinnamon. And I want to both thank you both for helping to get this or this whole idea of having a research summit together last year and now uh, all the planning that's going in. And as you said, having to retool completely. So it, it's really great that you're doing this. Last year was a huge success. Uh, and I'm really happy that we have this opportunity to continue uh, with, with this year, even during uh, COVID. Uh, we're adapting a lot, and I think that that's uh, really is a good indication, not just of, of Hatfield community, but but the whole OSU community uh, in how we're trying to deal with this. This is a really um, uh, important summit, I think. It, it gives us a chance to not only better know each other, but to really reach out and 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 seek different collaborations that are both intellectually stimulating. Uh, offer new opportunities for funding and supporting students uh, and, and really expanding our impact on, on the community, both the scientific community and, and the larger community at large. So it's, it's a, a great way of, of organizing, uh, uh, welcoming statements from our leadership uh, that really will demonstrate uh, the, their commitment to the type of work and, and uh, the organization that is Hatfield. The uh, lightning talks, ignite talks that, that really give us a, a quick or organizational view of sort of the diversity of what's done here. And then this discussion, these work groups, breakout groups that are an opportunity to really bring different disciplines together and, and talk about ideas. It, it's a great setting. So welcome, uh, thanks for being here and uh, let's get going. Uh, so I have the privilege of introducing three university and agency leaders who will each provide a short welcome to us. As a trio, they exemplify the wonderful support that Hatfield receives from this university and from our various partners. So our first welcome is from Dr. King Alexander, OSU's 15th president. King took the helm just this last July, 2020, during a time of great challenge, not just for the university, the state, and, and the whole nation. He brings greater than 20 years of experience in leadership roles in public universities, most recently serving as president and chancellor of Louisiana State University prior to coming to the correct university, OSU. <laughs> Dr. King, has a long record of commitment to inclusive excellence among students, faculty, and staff, and in providing access to affordable education. He's also a strong supporter of the land-grant college system, and particularly the teaching, research, and outreach philosophy of land-grant colleges, which is really exemplifies a lot of what we do at Hatfield. I stress his particular interest in research and the value of, of being a major research university, and more importantly, for his, for this audience, King understands and values the role of nationally recognized marine laboratories, such as we have at Hatfield. King, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I'm very pleased to join all of you today. Unfortunately, I would much rather be in person, uh, which I had 
intended to be as all of us have, have intended to do so, but look forward to joining you next year in the, on the third, uh, the third research summit uh, that will go forward about the same time next year. And hopefully we'll be able to gather and, and share ideas and, and exchange uh, just the work that we're doing because it is so important. Um, I welcome all the Oregon State University faculty, staff and students. I welcome members of the USDA, the EPA, NOAA, our close partnership with NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, as well as the Oregon Fish and Wildlife. And the fact that we have seven different academic colleges probably on this line today is, is remarkable. And it shows the value and the significance and importance of the work that is going on at Hatfield and in our marine studies area. Uh, HMSC is one of the most important marine science facilities, not just in the country, but in the world. It's been recognized by that. Um, as, a coast, as a coastal brat myself, from Northeast Florida growing up in the ocean about every weekend. I understand how marine land was formed for the University of Florida, but also how, how revered the folks at marine land in North Florida were when I told them that I will be going to Oregon State. They went on and on about how important and how significant our Hatfield campus is and the work that you do. As home to Oregon State University's Marine Studies Initiative, this, the work that you do helps sustain healthy oceans ensures wellness and promotes environmental health and economic prosperity for Oregon and beyond. And congratulations on the new facility that I was fortunate enough to tour about a month ago with Bob and, and Dr. Iram, Iram Turner. The new Gladys Valley Marine Studies building adds state-of-the-art labs, classrooms, and much more to expand the research and educational capacity of Hatfield and Oregon State University. It's innovative built, this innovative building designed as a national and global model for coastal communities and serves as a vertical evacuation site for hundreds of people if a tsunami were to strike the Newport area or the coast of, of Oregon. I'm extremely impressed with the collaboration that occurs, the collaboration not just among our colleges, our seven colleges involved, but the collaboration with our state and federal partners. Um, I, I've rarely seen a campus that is integrated so well with the federal government and state government Working on working collaboratively on solving the world's most significant problems. The Hatfield Marine Science Center is home to many important research programs, and just to highlight a few, um, one is a partnership between OSU and NOAA, which recently published the results of an underwater acoustic study regarding the role the, the, the role vessel noise plays in the environment. Another is an annual health checkups of Oregon's summer resident gray whales conducted by the Marine Mammal Institute researchers, which have shown a compelling relationship between changing ocean conditions, whale health, and prey availability. Another third research project recently is a $3.3 million grant from the National Science Foundation that will enable our researchers, the Oregon State University researchers with our federal partners to study the potential risks of microplastics and nanoplastics to aquatic life. This just shows you that the Hatfield Marine Science Center presents a, really presents a wonderful example of how Oregon State fulfills its mission as a land grant, sea grant, space grant, and sun grant university, utilizing teaching, research, and outreach and service and engagement. Oregon State University is very proud of the Hatfield Marine Science Center and the work that you do. And I think with each passing day, the work that you do becomes more significant, not just to the coast of Oregon, but to the world around us. As somebody that, that left Louisiana State University knowing that the state of Louisiana is losing a football field an hour of landmass, that we had to go to the Netherlands to study how to, how to keep, keep your country above water. Uh, the work that is going on at Hatfield could be among the most significant that the world needs and the world, the world demands. So I congratulate our researchers. The work that you're doing has impact, not just on Oregonians, but has impact nationally and every coastal environment throughout the world. So congratulations to all the researchers. And I look forward to seeing more of what you're doing and accomplishing and to be engaged more with the research activities that, that you have brought forward to Oregon State University and the impact that it will have on the country and the world around us. Thank you. Thank you very much, King. I really do appreciate uh, your thoughtful ideas about the, the value that Hatfield has, but being able to put it into a perspective that you have from, from so many different areas. Uh, so it, it really means a lot. I appreciate that. So our next welcome is from Dr. Kevin Werner. 
Kevin is the science and research director of NOAA's Northwest Fisheries Science Center, has been in that role since 2017. Hailing from NOAA's National Weather Service, Kevin brings years of experience working to connect science to application and policy in water resources and climate. Kevin holds degrees in atmospheric science, mathematics, public administration, and political science, which has served him well in overseeing the Northwest Fifty Science Center's mission of providing the science necessary to make informed marine resource management and policy decisions. Kevin's been an active supporter of the science and collaborations that exist here at Hatfield through the NOAA OSU partnership. And so I'm very appreciative of that. Kevin? Great, thanks. thanks Bob for that very kind introduction. It's great to see so many of you, 121 of you out there. Um, Bob asked me to say a little bit about what we do and how it connects with the, the university, Oregon State University. Um, I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction though. Um, I woke up this morning and I was thinking of Arthur C. Clarke and, and his third law. So if you're familiar with Arthur Clarke, he's a, he's a novelist, a futurist on the 20th century. Um, wrote a lot of science fiction, very engaged in science. Um, and his third law states that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, one of the things that I've learned in coming here to the Northwest Center um, and jumping into a, a whole bunch of scientific disciplines that, that are different from where I came from is just how true that is. So I wanted to say a little bit about that. So what we do at the Northwest Center um, it's, it's certainly magic-like to the layperson, and, it, and it's still somewhat magic-like to me three and a half years in. Um, this includes things like our surveys and our stock assessments that estimate how many fish are in the sea to support fisheries management. This includes our marine mammal research that has carefully tracked southern resident killer whales to aid in their conservation. Um, it includes our work in the rivers and the streams of the Pacific Northwest to understand how salmon and other fish use the habitat and the, the, and the impacts that humans have on that habitat. It includes our work in, in quote unquote small biology to understand how genetics and genomics um, work to provide information that can be useful for the management um, of both conservation and fisheries management. It includes our work in the ocean pollution areas and the aquaculture areas to protect the environment while also promoting economic growth. Um, and a whole lot more that I'm, I'm not gonna have time to get into here. But I, what I wanted to point out is that in addition to being um, a magic to the layperson, each one of those examples that I mentioned um, is an application to a real world problem and a real world need. This is what we do in NOAA um, and this is what we do at the Northwest Center. Um, and we do that most effectively when we partner with organizations like Oregon State University. Um, OSU and the Northwest Center have a long history of working closely together um, to make the, the, the whole bigger than the sum of the parts. Um, we do this best when we have understanding um, with each other, we have relationships with each other and we pair strengths with strengths. Um, meetings like this are, are so very important to make all that happen. Um, I, I too wish we were meeting in person, um, but I'm excited by the agenda that, that Bob and Lori have described. I wanted to close by circling back to Arthur Clarke and mentioning his first and second laws, which are sort of less well known than the third law. Um, and I think they're important for, the, for meetings like today. Um, but the first law, Clarke's first law is, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he is almost certainly right. When he states that something is impossible, he is very probably wrong. And then the second law, the only way of discovering the limits of possible is to venture a little ways past them into the impossible. And I think that's what, what we're all trying to do with, with meetings like this, um, even in these challenging times. And with that, I will yield the floor back to you, Bob. Well, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, those are inspiring words. Uh, I, I like the, the linkage to Arthur C. Clarke as well. I like his novels as well. <laughs> so, thanks very much. So our, our final welcome is from Dr. Arem Tumor. She's the interim vice president for research here at OSU. Arem is an accomplished researcher herself, former associate dean for research in OSU's College of Engineering, and she's a former program manager, excuse me, at NASA. She's also a professor in OSU's College of Engineering in the School of Mechanical, Industrial, and Manufacturing Engineering, or MIME. She brings over 20 years of research and experience, leadership experience to her role as the VP for research, where she oversees a growing research enterprise that exceeded $400 million this year. Among her many roles, she's responsible for the oversight of OSU's research centers and institutes. 
I value her insight and support that she provides to Hatfield. Arim? Oh, thank you. I wish I wish I knew to look back at my science fiction authors and come up with something <laughs> clever like Kevin did. Um, and thank you, Kevin, for those great comments. And thank you, King, very much for being so supportive of our research mission. And I really want to keep it short so we can get going. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for getting together to celebrate all that you've been doing as part of Hatfield and all that you've done this year. And I know the meeting is truncated quite a bit this year because of our new mode of, of operation due to this uh, crazy period we're going through. But I'm so pleased to see that you're all still taking the time to connect and share your work with each other. And as far as I can see, we're now at 126 participants, which I sincerely did not expect. So it's really, really impressive. Um, as Kate talked about, and uh, Bob mentioned as well, we've had a record year in terms of funding this year, and we're so very proud of the researchers, um, our faculty, our researchers, our students who do the research and the scholarship that make us shine at OSU, and much of that happens through the work you all do here at Hatfield, so thank you for that. And, uh, and I'm sad to say that I won't be sitting through all the uh, lightning talks and discussions afterwards because it's probably going to be the highlight once we stop talking here. Um, I, I just want to say a few words. I think Hatfield really contributes to the university's mission uh, quite significantly and it helps us stand out nationally and internationally through our marine and coastal work as uh, much of uh, what King mentioned as well. Um, and Hatfield is definitely one of the major investments of the research office. And I, I very much enjoy working with Bob and always, always learn something new when I visit Hatfield. And uh, it wasn't too long ago that King and I visited despite of what we're going through right now. Uh, we do think that Hatfield is especially unique at our universities as well as nationally in that we support a lot of our colleges. Um, we have five agency partners, including NOAA, USDA, US EPA, US uh, Fishers and Wildlife, uh, ODF and W. And we also host five uh, major programs, centers and institutes, including Simmers and Oregon Sea Grant program that also both report to the research office, but also Coombs and MMI and MSI. So it really is pretty unique. Uh, we, in addition to research, we also really value um, what we provide in terms of experiential education here. We do have a diverse re set of research topics, lots of things that you'll be talking about here. A lot of hands-on opportunities in both um, academic and government research labs uh, on topics, including fisheries, aquaculture, oceanography, geological interactions, marine mammals, genomics, conservation, coastal resiliency, most of uh, what you'll be talking about today. But we also have a strong graduate research program and a nationally recognized uh, um, um, uh, REU program with a focus on uh, underrepresented students, which is also fantastic. Finally, it goes without saying that we really value our contribution to the community, our coastal community, see ourselves as a major link to the Oregon coastal community through our visitor center. Even though it's closed right now, we um, have, um, we have plans and we're looking into how we can actually uh, start that, um, that experience again. Our K through marine education programs, uh, our strong support by the Oregon uh, Coastal Caucus and our major contribution to the Lincoln County economy. So I look forward to hearing about the conversations today. I'll be uh, meeting with Bob, I'm sure not uh, soon after soon after what you guys come up with today. And I especially think the breakout group discussions where you'll be discussing the future directions of where we wanna be, how we wanna position ourselves to take advantage of new funding opportunities and building new collaborations is really what this is all about. So I really, really have, uh, I hope you enjoy your afternoon and have a fantastic meeting. Thank you, Arim. I appreciate very much, again, uh, the support that you show and, and recognition of, of all that everyone here at Hatfield does. And I appreciate to all three of you for taking the time to show your support by giving these welcoming statements. A, a lot of um, 
a lot of what we do here really is important individually and to hear such support really means a lot. So now it's my opportunity to uh, give a little bit of an overview of Hatfield. We've heard some snippets of it in, in each of our, our welcoming statements. Uh, so some parts of those I can go through. And this, this is going to be um, for those who are new to Hatfield and maybe don't know the breadth of what we do here, but also perhaps for those who have been here for a while, but maybe have been sort of cloistered in their offices a little too much with the blinders on because they're really into their own work. And this will give us a chance to um, have a, a little bit of a, a better perspective of what goes on here. Uh, I will give a very brief history, uh, a view of the present and a look to the future. Um, I'm hoping that my screen, I guess I need to do the share screen. Or is this going to be done by Cinnamon? If you can share your screen, Bob, that would be great. Okay, PowerPoint, there it is. All right, so Cinnamon, this is the one that's on my desk. Uh, right. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone. So Hatfield started very um, small as a one building fisheries lab. And in the, the mid century, uh, it started its expansion first with a dock for small boats, and then finally the establishment of the Marine Science Center with a new multi-laboratory building uh, and visitor center. And this opening, this official opening was in 1965. So we're 55 years old. Well, I think we've come a very long way from this early campus to where we are today. We have 49 acres, we have ship operations, we have Oregon State buildings, we have federal and state agency buildings, and very importantly, we have a growth in people that have filled those buildings in, in uh, the, the real strength of our, our community here is the uh, commitment and the, the knowledge of, of all of our people. We are about 450 strong now, placing us as one of the nation's largest marine laboratories. Over the 50 years, as I mentioned, we've added these buildings and we've added agency partnerships that have blossomed into this strong community of collaboration. Most recently, we have the new Gladys Valley Marine Studies Building. And this new addition, this new facility is gonna add significantly to our research and uh, academic programming the top two floors here that you see in the rectangular part of the building are, are research and office spaces. The lower floor of that building offers two new high-tech classrooms, as well as a uh, wet lab for teaching. We also have an expanded auditorium and the new innovation laboratory. One of the uh, design structures that you actually see in this picture is the fact that the building was designed as a uh, tsunami Vertical Evacuation Center. So we have the ramp heading up. There's also hardened stairs and elevators inside uh, that we can move and sustain up to a, a thousand people on the roof. But we are more than just the buildings. What, who are the people that, that are part of Hatfield and this has been mentioned, there's seven colleges. Here's the list of the colleges. And you'll see that it's a diverse set of disciplines from ag sciences and, and college of science to veterinary medicine and engineering, education, liberal arts, and earth, ocean, and atmospheric, so oceanography. It's, it's a very diverse group uh, that are all represented here at Hatfield. Within those individual colleges, we also have a series of uh, institutes, centers, and initiatives here, uh, as some of them have been mentioned by, in our, our welcoming 
Coombs, Simmers, Marine Mammal Institute, the Marine Studies Initiative. We also have programs like the Molluscan Broodstock Program, which is, is a, a, a large uh, aquaculture uh, program, Oregon Sea Grant, the ship operations, and even a K through 12 uh, Oregon Coast STEM hub. So these programs bring a, an additional sense of, of diversity to the type of work that's done here. But we're more than just OSU. We have strong relationships with our federal and state agencies. NOAA is, is uh, mentioned uh, uh, frequently, uh, often thought of, at least in the public, for the ship ops that have moved here. But NOAA has been here, a, a member of the um, community for a very long time from the research perspective. There are four different divisions or groups within NOAA represented here. Uh, the Northwest Fishery Science Center, from which Kevin uh, 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 directs, uh, does research on ecology of, of marine and anadromous fish species, predominantly ground fish and salmon from the Pacific Northwest region. We also have the Alaska Fishery Science Center, which is represented by the Fisheries Behavioral Ecology Program. And their work is on fish behavior and environmental variation impact on the distribution and recruitment, primarily of Alaskan marine uh, species. We also house the um, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab. I know it says center, but it's a laboratory. And uh, PMEL houses the Earth Ocean Interactions Program, which studies natural processes between the solid earth and the ocean, particularly at the, at the sea floor. And focus there is on geological, <clears throat> chemical and biological aspects of hydro hydrothermal vents. And then finally, when the fleet arrived here, uh, the Marine Operations Center from the Pacific supports the operations of five of NOAA ships which operate within the uh, Pacific. And overall, the NOAA fleet's role is to support and collect environmental, oceanographic, and geodetic data, which is essential to meeting uh, NOAA's mission. And by having them here, it gives us uh, direct access uh, to many of our, our NOAA scientists and even university scientists to shipboard operations. Besides NOAA, we have uh, the USDA, particularly uh, represented by the Agricultural Research Service or ARS, and they conduct research and, and technologies to improve domestic aquaculture production here with a local focus on the molluscan shellfish aquaculture or oysters. The US Fish and Wildlife, focuses on the restoration and conservation of coastal wetlands. And they also serve as stewards of Coastal Oregon's National Marine Refugees. <clears throat> These are, are uh, very special places and uh, the fact that uh, Oregon has these marine refuges is really important in, in my perspective. The US EPA uh, has a laboratory here where they focus on, on research on impacts of environmental perturbations to coastal ecosystems uh, and estuaries in particular, with a, a focus on climate change and in ocean acidification impacts. And then finally, oh, there's the SPA. And finally, we have the um, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, which is responsible for conservation and management of Oost, Oost, uh, excuse me, Oregon's coastal and marine resources, so sort of inshore of uh, three miles. You'll see within across these different uh, agencies and OSU that there are a lot of overlap, uh, but there are also a lot of key specialties. And this brings a wide variety of areas of research. And so Hatfield is really sort of a mesocosm of all aspects of marine science and scholarship. So what's sort of some of the impact of this? Well, from a fiscal perspective, we have a combined operations and research budget of about $43 million per year. That enables us to do a lot of sort of cutting edge research, supporting a variety of students and scientists in their, their work, but it also has a very strong economic impact on the local community uh, on the coast. And not just fiscally, but the intellectual uh, contributions that come from the lab and supporting uh, the natural resource economy, for example. 
We also have impact on support of students uh, through graduate and undergraduate uh, uh, programming. Uh, with the, the presence of so many PIs and faculty at Hatfield, uh, we have a current uh, graduate student uh, residence of about 35 PhD and master students. And we also through courses, and, and this is expanding with the action uh, activities of the Marine Studies Initiative and the new Marine Studies uh, major in the College of Liberal Arts, that uh, is bringing from 75 uh, students per year up to 100, 150, 200 uh, over the next couple of years. We also gain substantially through the experiential opportunities that we can provide students, not only working in, in the labs of, of uh, OSU faculty, but importantly in our partner agencies, the laboratories of, of the scientists there. This gives a very uh, ex, uh, broader perspective for, for our students that come in for internships. We have funding from the National Science Foundation for the, the REU program. And we also have funding from our various agencies to, to help support this. So this is a fairly large internship program. And then we also have outreach and education uh, outside of the university, K through 12 learners. Uh, we bring about 35,000 K through 12 students through Hatfield every year. This is a remarkable number. It's supported by the Sea Grant uh, Education and the Visitor Center brings another 150,000 uh, people to Hatfields so who are, are very visible and a very impactful place. Uh, the, the, the fact that we have so many people coming through clearly draws the attention of not just Newport, uh, but the, the entire coast and, and, it's, uh, and the entire state. So the, they all sort of have a feeling of, of ownership of us and, and as they should, we're a state facility and it's great to have that sort of recognition. So that's sort of where we're at. And it's, it's amazing how we've gotten to this level. Uh, there's been continual growth uh, from the very onset but I think as we look forward the next year, the next uh, uh, five years, there's so much more uh, that we have opportunity to explore. And I'm going to go through a few uh, 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 programs that are, are present and, and are growing, uh, as well as some new ones that might be forming. So first of all, um, we have ship operations out here that are run by the um, uh, COS, the College of Earth, Ocean, Atmospheric Sciences. Uh, we have a, a, a several uh, significant ships, uh, including uh, the Cayus now, excuse me, Oceanus, the Cayus before that, um, and the Pacific Storm, which is run by the Marine Mammal Institute. But we also have a new uh, regional class vessel, research vessel that's uh, being built uh, through the design from OSU, and it will be delivered uh, uh, to Newport to OSU uh, in late 2021 and should be available, I believe, in 2022 for, for research. This will enable us to do a lot of, of uh, very high-tech, uh, state-of-the-art research uh, in coastal and, and uh, uh, actually Pacific-wide uh, sorts of studies. We also have growing partnerships through the um, presence of, of different programs, OOI, which is the Ocean Observatory Initiative, a um, very extensive set of sensors that are, are uh, connected back to the coast, real-time uh, data feeds uh, off of Newport and, and upward into Washington waters. We have PacWave, which is wave energy, but they are developing a new facility, which will include research and development uh, just south of us uh, uh, from, from Newport. And then our, our linkages with, with some of the existing centers, and I, I just list here uh, uh, the CGRB, which is the Center for Genomic Research and Biocomputing, uh, our, our interactions of different scientists with their facilities, with their computing capabilities, are, are constantly pushing them to look for new uh, technology and new ways that they can help us. So we, we have a great partnership with all of these in, in terms of of the, uh, our ability to conduct science at, at state-of-the-art means. We have new leadership. Last year's um, uh, first summit, we had the opportunity to welcome Lisa Balance. It was her second day as the new director of the Marine Mammal Institute. Well, this year we can welcome Francis Chan, who is the new 
director of SIMRS, the Cooperative Institute of the Marine Resources Science. Uh, taking over from, from Michael Banks, we recognize, uh, many of you recognize Francis, he's around here often, but we welcome him in this new role, uh, an exciting time for uh, the Cooperative Institute. We have new people coming, additional people, uh, and, I, and I'm just gonna highlight one group here within the USDA the, in, in ARS. Uh, ARS is adding uh, two to three new scientists to the Hatfield contingent. Uh, each of these scientists will bring uh, 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 staff and, and research staff and uh, will be working closely with the Molluscan Broodstock Program with, with Chris Langdon. Uh, but the skill sets that they're bringing will add other opportunities for collaborations, particularly in genetics, genomics, uh, and eventually um, physiology to add on top of the ecology that's done here. So uh, this sort of growth is, is a real uh, tribute to the, the current environment that we have for collaboration, but also is a real addition for us that we're proud of. We're also expanding through our linkages with the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, and it just overall the, the value of looking, taking STEM to STEAM, so bringing the arts and, and science together. Uh, it helps scientists look at, at what they're doing from different perspectives and the artists help explain and, and help interpret some of what the science is, is, might mean or, or could to the, the larger community. So we have residency programs planned, uh, new collaborations, new courses. Uh, this is, a, I think, a fairly exciting opportunity for us. We've even built into the new building a, a studio for uh, visiting uh, residents, uh, artists. And another area which I'm particularly excited about is the new Murdoch Innovation Laboratory or iLab, which is built into the new um, uh, Valley Marine Studies building. This is a space that will enable innovation, technology, developing new sensors or, or new tools that you might need. Um, it will uh, have not only the, the, the tools there, it'll uh, have people to help in training how to use those tools. Uh, they're familiar with design, it can help you work through some of the technology. And so we're envisioning uh, for students, for faculty, researchers, and even the community, uh, a variety of new opportunities to innovate. And, and this is, I think, is a really exciting part of, of what we're, we're uh, looking to in, in the next couple of years as we expand that. And finally, we've been also been approached by members of the um, legal world uh, who are very interested in hosting a, uh, having us host a Ocean Law Institute. This would serve sort of as a think tank or, or training uh, uh, seminar uh, sort of place where they would focus on the interface between ocean law and marine science. Uh, it, it's an exciting potential opportunity for us. It would certainly move us in another direction. And I, only, I, I list all of these just as sort of a um, excitement about what's coming in the next years. Uh, this, this, these are all here almost all already. And uh, today's meeting We'll hear some specifics about work that's being done, but as we get also into the discussion mode, we can look at, at all these different potential uh, opportunities that are, are right around the, the corner. So who is Hatfield? Hatfield is you. It's everyone that's on this, this line, all of our colleagues here. It's all the energy and excitement that occurs here. And I, uh, I wanna thank you all for being here, for being part of Hatfield. It certainly makes it uh, an exciting place for me to be uh, here. And I um, hope that, that today's summit really shares some of that excitement. So I'm gonna leave you with a video. Uh, it's a very fun video uh, uh, put together by Mark, Mark Farley. And it's sort of a, a rah-rah to warm us up uh, as we head into the Ignite uh, talks and um, welcome everyone. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Bob, for that wonderful introduction to Hatfield. And thank you, Mark, for a really fun video. It's amazing with a good soundtrack, what you can do. And Brendan, can we have our poll? And for those of you who can't see it, our poll question is, what are your expectations? What do you expect to get out of today? And your options are to learn something new, to meet new people, to form new collaborations, find out who's doing what you're just watching or other. And let me know, Brendan, when you get answers and tell us what the results were. Roger that. I'm going to let it go for about another 10 seconds or so. OK. And closing it in three, two, one, and here we go. Looks like we have learned something new at 49%, meet new people at 35%, form new collaborations at 33%, and with the highest response, find out more about who is doing what at HMSC at 68%. 8% uh, are just watching and 1% are other. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's impressive to see how many of us are really interested in, in learning about what other people at Hatfield are doing. So speaking of which, we are now going to turn to the rapid talks. So we have a whole series, 10 separate talks that will do just that. Let us learn about what other people are doing at Hatfield. Our first speaker in this is Ichung Chang. Ichung is a academic programs manager for Hatfield Marine Science Center. He's the one who takes care of all, all the many, many summer interns. And he's been at Hatfield since 2007, and he is going to be talking about equity and inclusion in marine science. Chung, are you on and can you share your screen? Hi, everyone. All right, let's see here. Um, Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yi Chung Chung. I'm the Academic Programs Manager at Hatfield Marine Science Center, and I was invited here today to introduce the topic of equity and inclusion in marine studies at today's research summit. I'm also representing the HMSC Working Group to Address Racial Injustice, created by Bob Cowan, our director. Um, I'd like to uh, Give, show you a representation uh, of a word cloud of our shared values at HMSC. Things that we all agree are good parts of our community, yet we still have a problem. For various reasons, not all feel welcome at HMSC. And it's not just at HMSC. Black, Indigenous, and people of color and other marginalized groups experiencing barriers to full, to full participation is a well-researched and documented problem across academia. This hurts our HMSC community and hinders academic excellence in general. So let's address this problem. The history of whiteness in STEM, as well as compulsory objectivity, have systematically excluded the expression of diverse identities, cultures, and backgrounds. Through an intersectional framework, it is clear that folks in STEM with multiple marginalized identities experience increased barriers to their success, endure micro and macro aggressions, and face elevated instances of imposter syndrome. Also, many white STEM researchers do not feel qualified or comfortable discussing social justice issues, racism, and discrimination. Fear of saying the wrong thing primarily stems from white fragility and a lack of experience discussing these really difficult topics. However, saving these conversations for the experts continues to perpetuate silence around equity in white dominated STEM spaces. We need these conversations and researchers need to feel equipped to have them. 
As a community, we need to address the importance of systemic ingrained racism in our university STEM fields, as well as Oregon and US that impact the participation of people of color in marine sciences. So as HMSC researchers and part of the community here, we need to be more inclusive, more equitable, and better support students, staff, and faculty from marginalized backgrounds. So the HMSC Working Group to Address Racial Injustice was created by the HMSC Director, Bob Cowan. The group is composed of HMSC community members, graduate students, staff, agency folks, and faculty who responded to the HMSC director's request. Current list of members include Allison Storms, Hillary Thalman, Jessica Miller, Karen Lohman, Lori Whitecamp, Megan Wilson, Melissa Reith, Daniel Palacios, and Cinnamon Moffat, and Shan Reed and myself. As a group, we recognize that this is much more than a research breakout group, but a greater community responsibility. So our group, our group is working to define our goals and actions in a strategic way that is conducive to sustained action and engagement. So action items we've discussed have included developing a shared frequent, like monthly or quarterly, engagement process that would include raising awareness, uh, be facilitated, uh, orientation to dialogue tools for, the, for this community. Identifying, collating, and developing resources, approaches, and tools to improve listening, provide opportunities for learning, and identify specific actions to address racial injustice. A specific example we're working on is this, a land acknowledgement statement for the Hatfield Marine Science Center. So what is a land acknowledgement statement? And this one here, we should acknowledge, honor, and make visible that these are the ancestral lands of the Tillamook, Siletz, Yakina, Kalapuya, and Sayuslaw peoples. This is an attempt at acknowledging it, but this is something we need to work on. And so, so back to my question, so what is a land acknowledgement statement? Uh, I'd like to share this explanation from a piece entitled Converting Words into Action. OSU recognizes past and present contributions of ind indigenous people. Ideas and initiatives have deeper meaning when they're acted upon. That's why Oregon State's indigenous community is showing the vital importance of presenting land acknowledgments. Statements that honor the present and past history of the land we reside on. In an authentic way. We're not just a people of the past, says Luhui White Bear, Assistant Director of Oregon State's Native American Longhouse, Elena House, and a member of the Coastal Band Chumash. She states, she emphasizes that indigenous people are still here and active contributors to the Oregon State and Corvallis communities and HMSC and the uh, Lincoln County communities. The landing Thank you. The land acknowledgement itself was built on work initiated by grassroots of the indigenous faculty, staff, and students. And this is something we can work toward uh, as a community here. We, we can't change the past, but we can have the power to learn from it and from another. Uh, together, we can do better. So I want to go on to uh, the other pieces that, that the group is working on, which is providing community resources. So here we have, uh, I'll be posting a link in the chat, uh, resources to facilitate educating the community, orientation to dialogue tools through two of our OSU websites. Um, there are workshops as well as other tools there. And then finally, I'd like to uh, put this community charge uh, from the committee, which is, uh, this is more than a committee or a research breakout group, but a greater community responsibility. Engage with this challenging, uncomfortable, but absolutely critical area of study in order to transform our understanding of systemic racism and its impacts on uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, students, staff, and faculty with the goal of creating a more just and equitable community at HMSC. So we encourage the committee we encourage everyone to join us and progress on this journey together. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Yichang. Appreciate it. Laurie, do you want to introduce our next speaker? Gladly. Our next speaker is Suzanne Brander. She's an assistant professor in the OSU Department of Fish and Wildlife and is a part of Coombs here on the coast. She's been affiliated with OSU for the last three years and is going to be talking about marine debris. Please help me welcome Suzanne. And thank you so much, Lori, for that introduction. And thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, and like Lori said, I'm going to be giving a quick and kind of high level of the marine debris field with a focus on what we do here at Oregon State University, which is on aquatic, uh, talking about freshwater, estuarine, and marine ecosystems. And I'm sure that most of us, if not everyone here, has seen a graphic like this when you're browsing through social media, for example. We know that plastic is entering the food chain, um, but beyond that, I want to talk a little bit beyond the hype um, and about what we know and also how we're trying to better understand um, the impacts, what they are and, and how, how far they go. So the plastics research field is still relatively new when you think about um, fields of marine science in the grand scheme of things. So this subfield, if you look at publications prior to 2010, you get a handful of papers on responses to plastics or ingestion. One of the earliest papers came out in 1972. People started to see pellets in the ocean that it were pre-production pellets from factories. But really, we didn't see an explosion in this research until about the past nine to 10 years. And so even, even if you look at publications between 2018 and 2020, you see that there's been substantial growth just in the past, past two years. And so often when I get the question, well, why don't we know more? It's really because we haven't been looking into, this, into these challenges for that long. But we do know collectively that this is a huge problem and that although plastic production didn't really begin to increase until the early 1980s or so, once we started to rely on plastics, uh, many of these have become single-use plastics, we saw this growth in plastic production and waste generation increase exponentially. So as of 2015, we had about 6,300 metric tons of plastic waste generated. To this day, we only recycle about 9% of that, and that's been a huge challenge due to lack of economic incentives. And we're looking at this nearly doubling um, if we continue with BAU, which is business as usual. Um, and we're also looking at plastics going from about 6% to up to 20% of global oil production. So this isn't just a plastic problem, it's a fossil fuel problem, which of course is also fueling climate change. So just a quick summary of research findings and we can get into uh, many more details in the discussion later. But we know that these plastics and fibers, and fibers are increasingly found um, now that we can look at even smaller plastics in hundreds of species of freshwater and marine organisms. We're finding them in terrestrial animals as well. I won't have time to go into that. But, and we know that this can, in some cases, affect things from growth to liver stress. It can affect things like respiration and immune response. And the more we look into this, the more we realize that the size and shape really matter. And smaller microplastics can be more damaging than larger ones potentially because they have the ability to get trapped inside an organism or can even translocate between different tissues if they're small enough. We know this is occurring across food webs, sometimes beginning with the smallest organisms and then being transferred up to larger, larger organisms. And they're, they're ubiquitous. So this is a picture of an arrow worm um, from the Mariana Trench. And there was a study that came out a couple of years ago that basically found fibers or plastics in all of these arrow worms that were captured in, in, that, in the, their um, sampling. So it gets complicated. And no need to take this in all at once, but what I'm trying to convey here, and this is a publication from a colleague of mine that came out a couple of years ago, is that when you study plastic, you're studying this diverse suite of pollutants. It's not just one type, one color, one size, one shape. You need to consider all the different chemistries of the different polymers. There are additives. There are different morphologies. 
And the colors and the pollutants that absorb to those uh, plastics also have to be considered. So you, you, can do the, you can do the math in your head and realize that um, there, are, there, there are an enormous number of experiments that need to be done to really get a handle on, on the whole, on the big picture. And nanoplastics too, um, which we can talk a little bit more about in the discussion, which isn't even discussed in this particular paper since it's a new size fraction um, that we're now investigating here at, at OSU. So we know about the food web issue. It's occurring across trophic levels and eventually ending up on our dinner plates. The exposure routes can be via ingestion, but also even in a marine or freshwater organism, they can absorb those or ingest, basically encounter those um, fibers or plastics through their gills. We know that it affects early life stages, and we're talking about things down to the smallest organisms. So this is a single-celled ciliate that lives in freshwater and estuarine ecosystems. Um, some recent research we did shows that they also ingest microplastics and that they're not able to ingest them, and they're then transferred up to um, sensitive uh, organisms such as larval fish. 30 seconds. So what do we do with so many microplastics in so little time, which I have very little left? I'll say that we're starting to use high throughput testing um, using adapted early life stage toxicity testing. And this is something we're doing at OSU where we're measuring responses like development and behavior to a large number of different types and sizes and shapes of microplastics to really just to try to get a handle on how response um, varies and how severely or you know how little of an impact some of these plastics might have on animals and that's time and i'll finish there by saying this is our uh, new pacific northwest consortium on plastics which was mentioned earlier and is uh, funded by the nsf thank you perfect thank you so much suzanne thank you for uh, wrapping up i appreciate it and helping us stay on time laurie do you want to introduce our next speaker we have ben up next yes ben laurel is a research fisheries biologist. He works for the Fisheries Behavior Ecology Program in the Race Division at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, one of the remnants of a, a long history of science centers within NOAA Fisheries. He's been at the Hatfield since 2005, and he is going to be talking about climate and ocean change. So, Ben, if you want to share your screen, turn on your mic and camera. Is that working? <laughs> Everybody hear me? Yeah. Good, sure. good cinnamon. Okay. Yes, you sound great. Well, thank you very much for the um, introduction and thank you again to the organizers. Uh, my name is Ben Laurel. I'm with the Fisheries Behavioral Ecology Program. Uh, this is part of the Alaska Fisheries Science Center uh, as part of NOAA. Um, our Group is pretty small. We're a group of about 12 folks that's uh, contractors and full time staff. And in addition to that, we have often students. Our program is currently in the small B form. We, our behavior component is pretty much a smaller component of our physiology and some of the other aspects of work that we're doing in the lab. But really, it's, it's focused on um, experimental facilities that we have, uh, focused on temperature, ocean acidification, ecotoxicology. We also maintain small nearshore monitoring programs in Alaska and the Gulf. And now with Louise Copeman's recent hire, uh, we stole her away from CIOS. She's now part of our group and as well as our lipid laboratories. So there's a lot of work on fish energetics condition and fatty acid biomarkers. Um, the centralized uh, seawater uh, chilling capabilities of our lab is really the signature part of our group where we're able to study fish in um, all sorts of climate scenarios from that are occurring now and possibly in the future. So we can study fish in the winter as well as in these higher latitudes with chilling seawater down to minus 1.5 degrees. And we maintain brood stock of a lot of important Alaska fisheries that we have six currently in as um, full-time residents in our laboratory, which is over 20,000 square feet. And we conduct studies starting from the egg um, and going and rearing fish all the way through the, the adult phases and into multi-generational studies. 
Um, to give you kind of an example of the kind of work that we do, I know everybody here is probably implicitly involved with some sort of climate research or has an explicit link. Um, I want to demonstrate sort of how our work at Half Yield sort of um, can address sort of emerging issues that are going on far away in Alaska and how that actually gets and makes an impression, um, not just from the new biology um, that we can learn from the fish, but how that actually impacts management. And the case here is with Pacific Cod. Um, for those that don't know, this is our new poster child for climate change and fisheries after the warm blob um, in the Gulf of Alaska, there was failed recruitment and the loss of adult biomass and uh, just this year, a closure of the federal fishery. And this is a big blow to Alaska because it's the second largest ground fish fishery there. And there's a lot of questions about how we contribute towards addressing about how this fish um, responded to um, a marine heat wave and what are the chances of uh, recruitment success in the future. And some of the different unique factors about the, the warm blob, as it's called, or this marine heat wave, was that it reached very, very deep into the water column. It wasn't just reserved to surface waters, it reaching down to 350 meters. And it didn't allow for much of the life history of the fish to sort of escape this warm water. And there was a lot of work that was been shown um, in, in the fishery, at least, that the fish were in poor condition. These older life stages were kind of struggling. There was evidence of metabolic stress and um, just evidence of um, loss or just the bioenergetic models were pointing to um, a lot of um, stress at the adult stage. But it was unclear what was going on at the early life history. And since we don't have real good observational programs in place to capture these events, that we're really relying on what we can learn from the biology of the animal at this early life stage, as well as um, how do we scale up that and to sort of get into sort of an impression of how that would impact um, recruitment later on. So thankfully, we again have uh, fish uh, Gulf of Alaska, Pacific Cod at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. Uh, we've been conducting lots of different experiments across the life history. Uh, some of the earlier work, or just recent work rather, uh, looking at the thermal effects on hatch success. These are demersal eggs, and you know they're generally pretty insulated from surface water uh, temperature fluctuations. But again, the warm blob reached down into the spawning beds, and just doing incubation experiments, we demonstrated that these animals are very thermally sensitive. This graph showing the hatch performance peaks around four and four and a half degrees, which is very different than compared to say congeners like walleye pollock, another important fishery in Alaska, which has a much broader thermal response. So what we could learn then, trying to advance the slide, sorry, I might go too. As we can take these thermal reaction norms and experimental um, data and scale them up by taking available temperature by depth and season, look historically about what spawning habitat may have looked like in the Gulf. Each panel represents a year, dark blue being a um, favorable spawning habitat conditions, um, and, and track this over time. And what we've shown is that um, in these warm blob years that indeed we've had this loss of spawning habitat of Pacific cod, and certainly the temperatures were above optimal in those years. And this has grabbed the attention now of, of the council. And so we've been asked to put these sorts of data together, combining experimental data with available temperature data to come up with a suitability index that can go have very different sorts of ways it gets into the council process, but there are avenues. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that from Kim later about ecosystem-based fisheries management. But this sort of um, data, you can see how sort of experiments at half yield can get translated and scaled up and, and, and make a pretty good um, impact um, at, at um, fisheries management. And I, I don't go too much we're there, sorry, I've been advancing the wrong slide. <laughs> That's the slide we should have been looking at. Um, these things can also be looked at spatially. So we can take regional oceanographic models and similarly we can look at range contraction and range expansion, not just in the Gulf of Alaska, but also into the Bering Sea. Again, starting with simple experimental models and scaling them with um, different temperature rasters that are available. So I'll stop there and um, Take any questions maybe at the end. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, 
we now have Kim that's coming up. Um, so Laura, do you want to introduce Kim? Yes, Kim Jacobson is a research zoologist. She works in the estuarine and ocean ecology program within the fish ecology division at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. She has been at Hatfield for a whopping 25 years and she will be talking today about shifting ecosystems. Please help me welcome Kim Jacobson. Thank you, can you see my screen? You are good, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you again. I'm honored uh, to share some highlights of our research that has captured ecosystem shifts in the Northern California current. Uh, but first I want to acknowledge my co-authors at the Marine Science Center and many others have contributed to these efforts, uh, a list of which no longer fits on a single slide after 25 years. Um, our core research team at the Marine Science Center is a combination of NOAA scientists from the Estuarine and Ocean Ecology Program and indispensable collaborators. Studies on plankton ecology were initiated by Bill Peterson in 96, and as part of this newly formed program with the late Bob Emmett, we began studies on juvenile salmon ecology soon after. Those original efforts continue, luckily, and have grown. This slide lists our major research surveys with time series long enough to detect ecosystem shifts. The Newport hydrographic line is sampled fortnightly to monthly for hydrography and plankton, whereas the juvenile salmon and ocean ecology and pre-recruit surveys are sampled annually, focusing on pelagic nectin. Together, these surveys characterize the pelagic ecosystem over fine temporal and broad spatial scales. Throughout um, most of the 1900s, there were rapid and persistent shifts in the California current ecosystem lasting 25 to 30 years related to different phases of the PDO. And these rapidly, um, these rapid shifts ultimately affect all ecosystem services. But just as we were starting to deal with shifts on a much shorter time scale, we got hit with the marine heat wave as Ben just showed you. And I will be focusing on some of the results um, that we saw during those heat waves. So among the differences we observed in the pelagic nekton with the heat wave, following the heat wave, were an influx of southern taxa, such as the Pacific pompano and the market squid. And the market squid have continued to increase in abundance in the Pacific Northwest. In fact, we have been modeling our squid catches with those from a similar Southwest Fisheries Science Survey and find that squid densities have increased approximately 60-fold across the Northern California current. These increases appear to be geographically uniform, except, as you can see on the right side panel, um, for, I'm sorry, except you can see center of, shifts in the center of gravity in the right side panel, primarily during those marine heat waves. We've also seen shifts from crustacean-dominated ecosystems to jellyfish-dominated ecosystems, as you can see here. In addition, from the Newport in addition, from the Newport hydrographic line, shifts in the phytoplankton community and the phenology and composition of ichthyoplankton have also been observed. Now, the anomalies of the biomass of northern and southern copepods in these figures show how the copepod community at mid-shelf off Newport at NH5 changes with different source waters. We typically see a seasonal shift in the community with an abundance of northern lipid rich copepod taxa in the summer and an abundance of southern and offshore copepods with less lipids in the winter. However, the anomalies of the different taxa also reflect their underlying basin scale climate events, such as phases of the PDO and ENSO events. And although the anomalies following the 2014 marine heat wave, you can see that very broad band of red there, um, although they look similar to previous events, this event brought many different oceanic and tropical species to the shelf, confirming the arrival of very different source waters and resulting in three years without a lipid-rich copepod community. In addition, laboratory analyses um, conducted with Louise Koopman and Kim Bernard of fatty acids and lipids revealed lipid deplete zooplankton and forage fish with low energy density. So I've shown you today just quickly some of the highlights um, that we've observed 
from our research, but also um, our program tracks, I'm sorry, our program not only tracks these changes, but provides um, early, providing early warning indicators is another goal of our program and of ecosystem-based management. Thus, with the expertise of Mary Hunsaker and collaborators, we are striving to learn if we can actually provide early warning indicators for impending ecosystem shifts using the empirical data. And what's the earliest we will be able to de detect community level sh shifts? And can we in fact forecast community level changes in relation to ocean conditions? Finally, some additional questions for discussions today and for hopefully future collaborative efforts from our group is, how do, we ch how do our changes at lower trophic levels that we've seen affect the higher trophic levels that we don't study? Do other Hatfield researchers see shifts in their study species that relate to our observations, or do they see different time periods as more important? How important is the persistence of an ecosystem shift once it's happened? 30 seconds. Thank you. And how can we incorporate different technologies and platforms to monitor or characterize shifts, such as acoustic data, gliders, um, stationary, other stationary platforms, or um, emerging technologies? And that's it. And I look forward to meeting people in the discussion group. Thank you so very much. Um, so, Tommy, you're up next. And, uh... Lisa, you'll be sharing Tommy's screen. So Lori, would like to introduce Tommy? Yes, so our next speaker is Tommy Swerigan. Tommy is the leader of the Human Dimensions Project, project for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. He has been at Hatfield since 2013 and he will talk about human dimensions research. Please help me welcome Tommy, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, my topic today is uh, human dimensions and the related research con uh, conducted by our program at Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Next slide, please. Uh, unlike just about everyone else, we're not actually uh, on the campus. We're south of the aquarium. And I only uh, refer to it as our secret garage because it is a garage. It's hard to find and it's not on Google Maps. Uh, next slide. We're a small team, uh, six agency staff and two fellowships. Uh, one person works in program administration and policy. There are three staff and one fellow working in uh, the ecological monitoring project. Then myself and one other uh, fellow uh, are working in the Human Dimensions Project. And then our uh, communications position is currently uh, vacant. Fun fact, we all hail from California, Maryland, Illinois, Alaska, Oregon, and Louisiana. So we actually cover all five of the US coast. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, Human Dimensions Project was created to fulfill a legislative mandate when the uh, marine reserves were first created. Our mandate is to monitor the socioeconomic impact of marine reserve implementation on the region, coastal communities, stakeholder groups, and on individual ocean users, both consumptive and non-consumptive users. Next slide. As such, we look at marine reserve impacts through the prism of social science, and we uh, assess the impact of the reserves from the broadest possible level of aggregation to progressively smaller levels of aggregation and then down to the individual level. At each step of the way, inevitably, we're employing different tools of social science and uh, we have a different range of research questions at each step. Next slide. Obviously, no one individual can have expertise across all these social science disciplines. 
We actually work with economists, social scientists, sociologists, political scientists, and anthropologists. Uh, while we primarily work with uh, university faculty and students at OSU and PSU, uh, we also work with um, re uh, economic consultants, other agency social scientists. Uh, we've worked with NGOs and we've also done some work with local community groups. Next slide. There's a pending legislative review of the Marine Reserves Program that uh, commences in 2022. And uh, uh, primary responsibility in our project is to analyze any changes which may have occurred since implementation so we have baseline and then we have assessment of change. So most of these studies are longitudinal. Our studies include the economic impact of fisheries and the potential impact of the reserves on commercial fisheries, the spatial model to assess behavioral change. We're also looking at uh, social welfare and economic data to assess community social coastal community socioeconomic change using time series analyses of secondary data. Uh, we conduct large scale survey research amongst the general public and also internally with uh, coastal visitors. And the purpose of those studies is to understand awareness, attitudes and support for the reserves. And then finally, uh, we're also investigating impacts on individual fishers whose uh, perspectives might not otherwise be adequately addressed with um, some of the other studies I've mentioned. And then, uh, next slide. Our burning issues. Uh, we are very concerned, of course, with uh, adverse socioeconomic impacts in, on uh, commercial fisheries but also are there positive economic impacts? Have we affected trip motives? Do more people visit the coast? Is there any impact on tourism? Uh, have uh, our, the, marine, the presence of marine reserves in our related communications actually affected awareness of the reserves and of other ocean issues? So we look at a, a range of ocean issues on, in some of our studies. 30 seconds. Okay, have knowledge and support changed since implementation? And finally, uh, we created a historic model of the spatial distribution of nearshore fisheries. What we wanna do now is integrate this approach more effectively into marine spatial planning and create a dynamic model of, uh, to predict fisheries behavior in the future. And final slide. And so those will be our topics in our uh, conversation room, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Tommy. I appreciate it. Um, Lisa, you're going to keep sharing, and our next speaker is Kathleen. So Kathleen O'Malley is a associate professor in the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Coombs, and she is the state fisheries geneticist. So she works for both OSU and Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. She's been at Hatfield since 2009, and she's going to be talking to us today about evolving genetic tools. Please help me welcome Kathleen. Hey, thank you, Lori, for the introduction, and thanks to you and Cinnamon for the invitation to present today. And good afternoon, Hatfield. Uh, yes, so while I, while I have been a professor at OSU since 2009, I transitioned into this new position as a state fisheries geneticist in 2017. So this position is new within the university and it is a collaborative partnership with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. So my lab consists of three faculty research assistants, Christine, David, and Sandra, as well as four graduate students, Stan, Jeffrey, Amy, and Shane. Now, as of last month, the lab's now located on the second floor of the new Marine Studies Building. So to put it simply, we study the DNA of fish to address the science and management needs of the state. We are a highly collaborative lab and partner with multiple state, federal, and tribal agencies academic colleagues, commercial and recreational fishermen, and maybe some of you in the future. Next slide. So our research focuses on a variety of freshwater anadromous and marine species as shown here. 
Given that these species inhabit a wide range of environments and exhibit diverse life histories from say a resident trout to a highly migratory albacore, the research questions, genetic methods, and analytical approaches vary considerably across our projects. Now, the cool thing is sampling for genetic studies is pretty straightforward and only requires taking a small piece of thin tissue. From this tissue, we can extract DNA and address most of the questions we are interested in. Next slide, please. So starting out with the basics, we can identify species based on their DNA. And this can be a valuable tool when it is challenging to do so by visual inspection. So an example shown here is of deacon and blue rockfish when they're less than 20 centimeters. We can also determine the sex of an individual. And this allows us to evaluate sex specific differences in say habitat use or migratory behavior. Now, while these are fairly straightforward examples of what we can do with DNA, they are fundamental steps for most of our projects and might be useful to some of you. Next slide, please. Now, a more advanced example of what we can do with DNA is to delineate population structure. So the question here is, do fish spawn in different areas resulting in genetically distinct groups, or do fish spawn in the same area resulting in basically one large panmictic population? So you can take, um, for example, albacore tuna. Interestingly, we don't really know where they spawn, and physical tagging data suggests there's limited migration across the equator. However, previous genetic studies have not detected uh, differences between albacore sampled in the North and South Pacific Oceans. Now, given the evolution of DNA sequencing technology, we now have greater power to detect genetic differences. Next slide, please. For example, we were able to identify almost 13,000 genetic markers in albacore. Now, a genetic marker is basically a difference in the DNA code as shown in this illustration on the left. So based on these markers, we found that albacore sampled in these two oceans are in fact genetically different, separating out into two clusters as shown in this figure on the right. So each dot represents a fish. The red ones were sampled in the North Pacific and the blue ones were sampled in the South Pacific. Next slide, please. But interestingly, based on the genetic profiles of individual fish, we were able to identify South Pacific albacore caught in the North Pacific Ocean. So this indicates that fish do in fact migrate across the equator. We also detected potential offspring of South and North Pacific albacore, which suggests that some fish from the two oceans spawn in the same geographic area. So to expand on this research, we are sampling hundreds of albacore off the West Coast. So if you study albacore or perhaps how ocean conditions influence migratory behaviors, or if you just like to fish for albacore and would consider collecting a piece of fin for us, Let's collaborate. Next slide, please. Now in contrast to albacore and many other fish species for that matter, a lot more time and money has been invested into studying the genetics of Chinook salmon, such that we are now able to identify specific genetic markers associated with traits, such as migration timing. Now by migration timing, I'm referring to when a fish returns to, uh, to the river to spawn, so either in the spring or fall. Now the discovery of these migration timing genetic markers was just made a couple of years ago by researchers in California and Idaho. Now under, current, under the current management structure, spring and fall run Chinook within a river are considered more closely related to each other than to fish from the adjacent river. Next slide, please. However, this new genetic discovery has resulted in the filing of multiple petitions in California and Oregon, requesting NOAA to reevaluate how Chinook salmon are managed. So petitioners suggest that spring run Chinook along the Oregon, Oregon coast should be managed separately from fall run and in doing so should be listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Now currently there is little genetic data available for coastal Oregon Chinook populations. So we are working with ODFW to fill in some critical information gaps. Now perhaps some of you are studying coastal Oregon uh, Chinook or again are simply just keen to fish for salmon and would be willing to provide some fin clips. Either way, Let's talk and potentially collaborate. Next slide. Thanks for your time and I look forward to conversing with you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was perfect. Um, so Lisa, you get a, a little break so you can stop sharing. And um, Laurie, do you want to introduce Aaron? Yes. So Aaron Berger is a colleague of mine. He works, he's a research mathematical statistician. He also works for the Northwest Fishery Science Center but in the FRAM division, Fisheries Research, I can't remember what it stands for. 
in the within the population ecology is a group he's been associated with Hatfield for six years and he will be talking about population dynamics go ahead Aaron okay thanks yeah hi everyone and welcome to my home office uh, as Laurie said um, my name is Aaron Berger and I'll be talking about population dynamics today um, with some interrupt? specifics about can I yep. interrupt real quick and just have you hide the little box on the bottom that we talked about yesterday? Oh, Perfect. right there it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And um, so, yeah, population dynamics with some specifics about my related research and important research questions. Um, I am affiliated with the Population Ecology Program, uh, or PEP, within the FRAM division at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. PEP personnel are divided between Seattle and Newport research stations, with the majority of stock assessment folks being in Seattle. The two exceptions are myself and Andy Stevens as stock assessors in Newport. In addition, Newport also is home to the Aging Lab, um, the NOAA Aging Lab, that is, at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and currently one postdoc scholar, Dr. Kathleen Vestfalls, though two more postdoc positions are currently being advertised. I regularly collaborate with several research groups uh, on the HMSC campus. Um, my main population dynamic related research topics are to improve data used in stock assessment, improve methods associated with stock assessment procedures, and improve approaches for providing robust management options. So population dynamics at uh, the core is really quite simple. We are trying to track population fluctuations over some speci uh, specified unit of time and space by quantifying things that increase biomass, like recruitment to the population and fish growth, as well as things that decrease biomass, like mortality from natural causes and from the fishing process itself. And for many marine species, there is the addition of movement to consider in the form of emigration and immigration from either stock units or movement among discrete population segments within a particular stock. There is a long-standing tradition to use population dynamic models as a way to assess whether we are fishing too heavily or there is excess production such that we can fish harder. It is this stock to fleet interaction that is used to understand if fishing is sustainable or not. And to understand that, we conduct stock assessments where data and parameters are used to inform mathematical statements about population dynamics within a model to obtain outputs, such as current biomass relative to reference points, that are used to inform management decisions. However, a new paradigm has emerged that applies to population dynamics and management of marine fishes which is one that includes broader ecosystem considerations into the management decision-making framework, or ecosystem-based fisheries management, EBFM for short. Uh, the general idea here is that multiple programs or areas of study feed into not only the stock assessment process itself that leads to species level advice, but also incorporates integrated ecosystem assessments, or IEAs, to understand the linkages between species and ecosystem level advice. This is one area I see a lot of opportunity for new and continued collaborations with HMSC partners, and I'm reassured by that by some of the talks I've already seen. In terms of my work and research, I conduct biennial stock assessments with a lot of collaborative help, as indicated by the parentheticals, for a variety of West Coast ground fish species and an annual stock assessment for Pacific Hake, jointly with Canada through the Pacific Hake treaty process. Within population dynamics itself, some current projects include advancing methods to incorporate spatial processes into stock assessment and management, and evaluating the utility of acoustic data collected from unmanned sail drones for stock assessment purposes. I'm also involved with projects that are linking oceanographic information mechanistically to population dynamics and projects that are looking at ways to improve the procedures that are used to manage stocks, especially under ecosystem or climate changes and when stock ranges are transboundary from a, a governing uh, or political type of perspective. Several, though certainly not exhaustive, questions that I see as pertinent for contemporary population dynamics research, which admittedly is based 
or biased rather towards stock uh, assessment procedures, given my area of expertise, include improving ways to link ecosystem variables to stock assessment. So for example, through a better understanding of basic life history parameters, improved data collection procedures and surveys, particularly for nearshore species, time varying and spatial processes as the dynamic nature of marine systems uh, has proven difficult to capture and translate into large scale management advice. But the emerging paradigm of dynamic ocean management through improved data collection, near real time data availability will help with this. Also linking ecosystem information to management either through a stock assessment explicitly or through a set of system indicators will continue to be important as well evaluating alternative spatial management procedures that exist such as marine protected areas or refugia or evolve as a result of new research. 30 seconds. Lastly, there, thank you. Lastly, there's a suite of statistical and mathematical methods such as the use of random effects and complex integrated population models and properly accounting for correlation structure, among other things, that could considerably improve the performance of population dynamic models. I'm looking forward to hearing some uh, more ideas and research questions in the breakout session later this afternoon. And then real quickly, lastly, um, uh, I wanted to announce some upcoming opportunities for you to additionally get involved with or share your population dynamics related research. There is a topic, uh, comprehensive population dynamic modeling symposium at the upcoming 2020 World Fisheries Congress in Australia, as well as a, a workshop um, that you can get involved with. So please contact me if you would like further details on either of these. That's it, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Aaron. We appreciate that a lot. Um, so next up is Steve and Lisa. You're going to share Steve's slides. And Lori, do you want to introduce Steve? Thanks, Aaron. Yes. Steve Rumrell is the shellfish program leader at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Marine Resource Program. He has been affiliated with Hatfield for 30 years, but it became didn't become his primary workstation until 2011. And Steve is going to be talking about nearshore ecosystems. Please help me welcome Steve. All right, thanks, Lori. Uh, and I hope you can hear me all right. My voice is a little, little weak today. Uh, my we, name we can hear you fine. Okay, my name is Steve Rumrell and I'm the shellfish program leader. Uh, I work with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as part of the Marine Resources Program. Uh, I'm fortunate to work with a group, uh, Shell Nation. Uh, our group is pretty big, 15 staff, and we're located in a laboratory up in Astoria, uh, in Tillamook, our home base, and most of our staff right here in Newport and also down in Charleston. Our focal uh, species include the shellfish, that weird amalgam uh, mix of species of invertebrates. Uh, here it's shown with the octopus, but our, our primary focal species are Dungeness crab, red rock crab, a whole diversity of bay clams, including cockles and butter clams, gaper clams, little neck clams, uh, non-native uh, purple varnish clams. Uh, we also manage the uh, lucrative uh, pink shrimp, Oregon pink shrimp fishery. Uh, our team handles the razor clam fisheries on the sandy beaches, uh, the uh, commercial and uh, recreational harvest of, of uh, urchins, and also uh, the recreational harvest of abalone. The suite of activities encompassed by the shellfish program within ODFW include, uh, of course, monitoring of commercial and recreational harvest activities. Uh, and uh, that's a very important uh, part of what we do, just to keep tabs on the level of activities and, uh, and where they're occurring, what time of year, uh, but just uh, to make sure that we allow harvests uh, for commercial and, per and uh, recreational purposes, but at a sustainable level. Our team also handles the stock assessments and characterization of shellfish habitats for a large group of species including uh, the bay clams in estuaries. Uh, we are surveying the crab populations in estuaries, the razor clam stock assessments along sandy beaches, uh, recently conducted the stock assessment and mapping of Olympia oysters, native Olympia oysters in Yaquina Bay. Uh, and our team is also handling the stock assessment surveys for sea urchins and abalone in the subtitle Rocky Reef Habitats, which I'll refer, come back to a little bit later. Our team is also conducting uh, research and monitoring 
to contribute to the early warning system for harmful algal blooms in the Pacific Northwest. Those data sets are contributed to the Pacific Northwest Harmful Algal Bloom Bulletin. So important piece of uh, keeping tabs on the levels of marine biotoxins and uh, risk associated with that. Our team is also an active collaborator on research on a variety of different shellfish issues. Uh, we're collaborating with, uh, with academics um, and uh, agency researchers looking at contaminants in shellfish. Uh, we're looking at ecological interactions between shellfish and, uh, and eelgrass beds and uh, interactions among uh, other species, uh, ocean acidification impacts, looking at responses to hypoxia, uh, new uh, infestations by non-native species, a whole group of uh, collaborative research projects. And then finally, our, our group is also involved in uh, review, ongoing review of the rules and regulations regarding shellfish harvest activities and adapting those uh, as needed. And then finally, we have an active education and outreach program as well. Okay, can I have the next slide? So Lori asked me to talk about nearshore systems. And I wanna just say first off that uh, many, if in fact, uh, most of us here at HMSC conduct a significant part of our research within nearshore systems. However, we really have su uh, substantially different perspectives on the spatial scale and scope of processes that are encompassed by this big term, nearshore systems. So I wanna just spend some time just introducing what are nearshore systems? Nearshore systems intrinsically, I think we think that we understand what those are. They're close to shoreline, but they're really defined by the spatial scale the location and the types of processes that we're interested in. For example, uh, if you're looking at uh, issues out on the continental shelf or in the California current or in the Columbia River plume, these are really you know, mega nearshore systems, really oceanic systems that occur up along the edge of the continent. Uh, if you were looking at a closer scale down at upwelling dynamics and upwelling zones, or the formation, duration, frequency, and intensity of hypoxia or ocean acidification hotspots, or even just characterizing the Oregon coastal current, these are really offshore events that are you know, near shore at the meso scale. On the far right, uh, this map just shows that the Oregon coastal current mapping the turbidity, the heavy turbidity associated with our coastal rivers and streams pouring into the near shore and moving out into the offshore area. You can 30 see- 30 seconds. Top. Pardon? 30 seconds. All right, thanks. Uh, you can see the top, the, uh, the Columbia River plume up on the top and all these others coming on down. Next slide, please. So I just wanna point out that uh, we're, we're using the nearshore systems uh, definition as defined by the coastal and marine ecological classification standard. And I wanna just, leave that with you that uh, there's a definition for near shore that goes from zero out to 30 meters. And uh, it's a very narrow, shallow area. Can I have the next slide? Uh, so it's very shallow, very narrow, uh, but it encompasses heterogeneous habitats and a great diversity of ecological communities. So in the, um, in the breakout group, we're gonna talk about a series of questions that link the offshore areas, the oceanic areas, and this very narrow heterogeneous strip along the coastline uh, that is the near shore. Okay, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. And uh, Steve is one of the reasons why I was introduced to Hatfield through Shell Nation. So appreciate Steve as well. Um, so our next speaker is Aaron and Lisa, you're going to continue to share screen. So Steve, you can go ahead and shut off your mic and stop your um, camera and Laura, you can introduce Aaron. Yes, Aaron Chappelle is a, also a colleague of mine. He's a research fisheries biologist with the fisheries research survey team at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, which like Aaron Berger is part of the FRAM division, the Fishery Resource Analysis and Monitoring Division. He's been at Hatfield for about 15 years, the first half working with ODFW and then uh, the second half working with NOAA. And he will be talking about community engagement. Please help me welcome 
Aaron Chappell. Thanks a lot, Laurie. I appreciate that. Um, as she said, I, I work for uh, the fisheries research survey team at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And our team is split between Newport and Seattle. We have four staff in Newport uh, who work at the Barry Fisher Building and seven staff that work in Seattle. And we operate two fishery independent surveys that utilize chartered industry vessels. Uh, and today I'm gonna to be providing some more details on one of those, the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. And it's really fostered a positive industry science relationship and has also had some unexpected positive spillover in some other areas. And I realize this is a busy slide, especially for introduction, but uh, that busy nature is somewhat beholden in our team and also in our relationships with uh, the industry and our research collaborators. And our team's research is pretty wide ranging, uh, but the primary duties uh, of our survey are to collect uh, high quality biological information for use and management of more than 90 commercially and recreationally important groundfish species off our coast. And we also collect information for in-house diet, genetic and um, maturity studies, as well as oceanographic information and ecosystem sciences information. Next slide, please. So although NOAA has operated several ground or had operated several groundfish uh, surveys all the way back to 1977, uh, crashing populations of those groundfish in the 80s and 90s, particularly rockfish stocks, uh, led to a federal economic disaster declaration in 2000. And the severity of those population crashes uh, really reached an inflection point that brought together two seemingly unlikely partners in a bid to repair that damage. And, th and those two groups were expert commercial fishermen and professional fishery scientists. And in fact, fishermen actually approached NOAA in the mid 1990s uh, in an effort to increase survey coverage across uh, groundfish habitats and to lead to the better informing of stock assessments, uh, reduce overfishing and also to recover fish to, fishable levels again. And the results of several years of meetings, discussions, planning, and the proverbial peeling back of uh, layers on each side led to uh, the creation of a product that was acceptable to everybody, and that was the West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. And it's been in its current format since 2003. And as they say, the results tend to speak for themselves. As you can see in this figure, we've seen the rebounds of all the overfish stocks, uh, aside from one, uh, that remains in the over, overfish level at the end of 2019. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of pros and cons to a cooperative research platform, but for our purposes and research, we feel it's definitely ideal and the right way to go about um, our goals. Uh, there's a lot of different areas to highlight in our industry science partnership, but really the important underlying themes are listening, learning, and working together. And um, by directly including community partners, that really helps to bridge mistrust gaps. And then working hard together uh, helps to break down barriers. And we really rely heavily on a volunteer scientist pool to staff our surveys. And often those include stock assessors, council members, fishery policy experts, and NGO employees. And by having these types of folks out on the survey, uh, and seeing the fishing operations firsthand and, and talking with the fishermen firsthand, the survey uh, platform really helps to create this direct line of communication between those who depend on the resource for their livelihoods and those who make decisions directly impacting those livelihoods. And I just kind of like to think of this as uh, we're at our best when our science is defended by industry and uh, when industry's business plans are supported by that same science. Next slide, please. So I mentioned these unintended positive spillover benefits earlier, and that's another area where our survey really shines. Uh, we have created opportunities for volunteers, especially students and interns, to implement their research and get a taste of field work. And volunteering is also great for prospective employees to get their foot in the door. And that's exactly how I became a, a member of this team. Uh, we also host a number of internal and external partners in collaborating for special projects. 
And all these relationships have created a far reaching network that goes well outside any one group or agency. And it's especially apparent within the HMSC community. And uh, whether it's sharing labs or equipments or just bending an ear of somebody next door on a research theme or a problem, uh, community collaboration and engagement is really deeply intertwined in that network. Next slide. At the end of the day, uh, the research model we have created, while it's not perfect, has proven to be really effective at producing good science, developing strong relationships within the, the industry, and providing opportunities for partnerships within the research community, as well as creating seconds. friendships uh, across uh, all these groups. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to post a link in the chat to uh, another one of our web pages that has a really excellently made video that takes into more detail uh, what I talked about today. But I just wanna wrap things up with a few key buzzwords, phrases to uh, get our minds thinking about the discussion in the conversation rooms coming up here. And uh, I just wanna say thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Aaron, appreciate it. Um, and so next we have Taylor. Lisa, you can stop sharing what you did. Um, Laura, you wanna introduce Taylor? Yes, Taylor is an assistant professor at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and at Coombs on the coast. He's been at Hatfield for one year and he's gonna to talk to us about emerging technologies. Please help me welcome Taylor. Great, thanks, thanks, Lori. Um, thank you for, for having me today. And I am here to talk about emerging technologies and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my research and some of the other um, cool technologies that different folks around uh, Hatfield are using. So I am part of Oregon State and part of the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station. Uh, and I lead the Big Fish Lab. Uh, and we look at the biological and ecological dynamics of marine predators. Uh, and I'd um, like to put up a, a huge list of, of current collaborators, but since I've been here a year and I've been in COVID for most of that, I have a, a group of you that I've talked about different cool projects that we can do. Um, and then some folks that I hope that, that we can talk about collaborations in the future. So I've got a list of, of group members that I'd, I'd love to have um, uh, to talk with later in, in either later today or, or time in the future. Um, Cause I think some of the, the projects that we all do have some great synergies. So um, my work has, has mainly focused on, um, on studying big fish and movements of big fish in, in the ocean. And a lot of that has to do with uh, electronic tagging. Um, and historically, the, the way that we've, we've sort of understood uh, animal movement is, is based on looking at these horizontal movements of animals from these tags. And so these are some of the, um, the animals that were tagged through the tagging and Pacific Pelagics projects that I've been involved in for about the past 15 years. But a lot of these, uh, these data were, um, were movement, horizontal movement with a little bit of vertical distribution data. Uh, and so what I'm more interested in now is, is getting into the finer scale movements and behaviors, the drivers of these large scale movements, and then what these animals are doing at these different locations. And so one of the technologies that I use a lot now are biologging tags. And biologging tags are basically uh, onboard um, cameras and computers that, that have inertial sensors that can pick up the, the individual small scale movements of the animals, as well as um, taking video of the habitat or the interactions, the behavior that the animals are doing within their environment. So this much finer scale, finer uh, graded picture than we could do with the, uh, the original movement tags that we're using. And so this is just a short video of, a, of one of these camera tags that's on the back of a white shark. And you can see its head moving back and forth. It gives you an idea of its tail frequency. This animal is doing one of these really dynamic behaviors, uh, which is jumping out of the water, breaching out of the water and coming down. And so not only can we see it from the animal's perspective and see what it's doing, we can recreate its behavior from the data. And so we can look at its tail frequency, um, we can look at the physiology, the energetics that this behavior, behavior takes, um, as well as the, the power that the animal is actually uh, creating in its tail um, to, to move it from a few miles an hour uh, up to about 25 miles an hour. So these biologging tags really give us this unique perspective um, from the animal's point of view of, of what's happening and allow us to recreate those, those behaviors and those movements. Uh, and when we get down into the data, these are the types of data that we get from those tags. And so this is that, that um, breach behavior that we saw a few moments ago. On the top here is the depth, um, the depth plot. And then the lower plot there is the, um, 
is basically your sway is your tail beat frequency or the, or the force of your tail beat. So we can see this animal goes from about one tail beat every three or four seconds to up to between four and eight tail beats in a single second at the peak of its output. So these biologging tags really give us an opportunity to look at really what the animal is doing in a, in a sub second by sub second rate, um, which tells us a lot about what it takes to be an animal in the ocean. Well, I'm also using these tags to start to understand more about the environment around these animals. And so we have these, these opportunities to get uh, ancillary data. So if I put a tag on an animal to look at how it's behaving, um, these uh, cameras that are on are maybe recording the environment around them as well. So what we're, we're doing is starting to use um, these animals as uh, autonomous survey vehicles. And so in places um, like the Indian Ocean where I do some work, these animals are, sharks are dropping down to 70, 80 meters down and seeing these um, deep water reefs, a place that, that as divers, we can't go. Um, and so we're able to survey these reefs in the same way that you would a diver um, based survey, we can survey these reefs the same way. And so it's allowing us to go places that we couldn't normally go um, and collect data from times that we wouldn't normally be able to collect data. Again, these are studies that are purposeful for other reasons for studying animal behavior, but we can also um, get information about the, the reefs, about the um, fish, fisheries assemblages and things like that. So uh, I talked about these, these biologging tags, these camera tags that we put on, and this is one on the fin of a, a salmon shark um, uh, up in Alaska, but we also use a number of different technologies and, and some other folks have, have, have touched on these as well. This is a sail drone in the top left and a slocum glider, glider on the bottom right. And so um, we use these to understand the, the habitat around these animals. So these have um, animal sensors on them. So when a shark or a fish with an acoustic tag on it swims by this, uh, these platforms will detect those, the, uh, the presence of those animals uh, and then profile the water column around them. So we can start to understand the, the, the three-dimensional structure and three-dimensional environment around the, these animals and places that they're choosing to be. Um, we also do tag developments. Um, these are magnetic tags that we're developing in the lab, as well as putting a, uh, proposing to put a, a whole telemetry system along the west coast of the U.S., which would pick up um, uh, any animals that have acoustic tags, including salmon, sturgeon, things like that. Uh, and then the Icarus space station or satellite system, which is an animal based system, which I'm happy to talk about more uh, in the next section. Um, these are continuing on with different species here along the West Coast up in the Northwest. Uh, and then very briefly, just a couple of the projects that we'll talk about in the breakout session. This is Tony, uh, Tony D'Andrea's group at ODFW using unmanned aircraft systems to, um, to map um, nearshore habitats. Uh, and then Bob Cowan's group using um, uh, basically computer learning in order to quantify um, millions and millions of data points worth of, of images. Um, so these, again, are some of the more uh, other technologies that we'll talk about um, later in our breakout group. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much. Lori, do you want to wrap us up? Yes, I'd like to first thank all the speakers. I think if you came here to learn something new, you were not disappointed. Those were really excellent speakers. And thank you for all the people who volunteered when we asked them. And for those of you who are just attending the talks, then you are done. If you're going to stay on, I, I should say also, I'd like to thank all the agency heads who have allowed their staff to participate in today's meeting. And if you are gonna stay on and be part of the conversation rooms, do not leave the meeting, stay where you are, but we're gonna take a break for the next 10 minutes. We will reconvene at 10 minutes after three. And do we have time for the breakout poll? Are we I just gonna- Put the breakup poll up and you can go take your break, but at some point, go ahead and fill that out. I've also been asked to just do a little plug if you enjoyed our uh, rapid talks to think about joining State of the Coast next week. Um, and Shelby might be able to put in the link to that in uh, the chat box to everybody. Uh, we'll see everybody in, what, Lori, 10 minutes? 10 minutes, yes. We are right on time, so good job. <laughs>